And so those are the high risk kids. Those are the ones that we're going to worry the most about on how they respond, how they grieve, how they deal with what's happened. The second circle then is, and you're going to see this later on in a couple of slides with grieving, is those students who have attempted or experienced a loss on their own. So we call those our high risk kids in a school. We know they, they may have attempted, may have been hospitalized, may have lost a family member to suicide or may have had an experience of, of, of a recent loss. So really important to get that second tier to reach out and identify those kids. And then the third part is the community. You know, how do we, we tend to, we tend to focus on the school and a lot of times it's just the class that that young person it is, is in. But it's important to remember that we really need to reach out to students, staff, and the community to help heal. Uh, it is not just those young kids uh, in that one classroom of their peer. So um, I need to jump back. Here's one of the things that, that I've learned. Uh, unfortunately, I've now been involved with over 50 youth suicides and I get called in a lot with the postvention. But even the kids that didn't know the deceased may have other stressors in their life. And that's kind of that second circle. They may have lost a loved one and their feelings may be extra sensitive. So their emotions may not even be connected to uh, the incident, but they're struggling with their own emotions. And they're just as important to help heal and bring back to normalcy as, as anybody else. Um, after the suicide of a peer, and this is what we try to help young people understand, it's, it's like the whole world is turned upside down. And, and for a lot of young people that are close to the individual, uh, nothing makes sense. They don't want to talk about it. Sometimes they're angry. You know, everyone grieves differently. Uh, and for a lot of young people that may not have had an experience with death, my wife and I, my wife is a therapist with the VA, and you're going to see some slides that that she uses when she deals with veterans and others with grieving and stuff. But, you know, for a lot of students and individuals, at that moment, it feels like things will never be the same again. You know, the world has ended uh, and there's a, a lot of emotions going along with it. So what are the talking points? And these are the things that I think help start the process of um, of grieving and helping someone through it. You're going to see some slides of what um, uh, therapists use, slides that are used from the emergency room when kids come in, and slides from some of the premier experts uh, on grieving. Uh, and I use suicide. It could be anything. It could be a a family member. It, you know, it, it could be any perspective that way. I just use um, uh, suicide as, as an example for what um, uh, I deal with personally. So, um, you know, as you start to talk with kids, especially you counselors and teachers and advisors, et cetera, and, and even parents, um, you know, it's difficult to understand why someone would even consider taking their life. Um, the majority of people who have bad things happen or have a lot of stress don't take their lives. So we know something else is happening in the brain of the someone who, who kills himself. So you're trying to help that young person understand some of the challenges that that peer may have gone through. Um, be very clear that suicide is not a way to solve a mental health or health problem. We talk a lot about that um, because of 13 reasons why. Um, but this is really what we're going to talk about, understanding grief. And this is the thing that, that I, I really want um, uh, to spend the time and answer your questions, et cetera. Um, those that experience the personal loss, and it's really important to remember that they need to have time to memorialize or repeatedly remember the deceased. Too many times we as adults want to shut it down immediately and we want to stop. And one of the most important things we can do is to give them time to remember um, not the incident, but the individual and the positive things from their life. My wife designed this as a therapist because she works a lot with vets that, are, that have come back from Afghanistan, Iraq, and other wars. And she talks about the, it, you know, it's almost like the Google of Ross, but um, um, it, it's kind of the cycles that we go through. And, you know, Google Ross talks about the five stages. And, and what we now know is people may only go through one stage. And, and um, 
and, and be in that stage for a long period of time. They may not go through any of them, but what my wife has found is that the denial, the denial rises to the top. And then a lot of times from that denial, it'll go down to depression. And then many, many times they'll bounce across to bargaining and then even the anger, you know, why did they do this? Or why is this happening to me, et cetera? So it's different for every person. What are the physical reactions to someone that's going to uh, grieve and, you know, the shocking and upsetting news? You know, a lot of times the heart races, they feel nervous. There's disturbing thoughts. For many young people, they can't concentrate for three or four days. It's, it's why we tell teachers, you know, go slow when you return to the classroom. You're going to have some kids that are not affected at all, but you're going to have some kids that are affected. Um, can't sleep at night, so we try to educate the parents. They don't feel like eating. Uh, in many situations, they just want to be alone. And a lot of times they want to be alone because we as adults keep wanting them to talk. And we worry that if they're not talking, then they're getting depressed. And it's important to kind of back off and give them that opportunity to be alone. And then in a lot of situations, they feel really down. They feel like, you know, this isn't working and I'm just so overwhelmed. So understanding grief in the sense that um, there are those that have an intimate loss and experience a whole. And those are the individuals that have the need to process the loss continually. And eventually they're probably going to be need to be seen by a professional because that hole is not being filled and they don't have the ability, the skill set at that point. You know, they memorialize repeatedly and they experience the loss of the future. Thus the hole that they need to fill with time and, and memories. And we try to tell parents, you know, that after you know, a couple of weeks, if your child is not getting through this, they probably need to talk to someone, a, a professional. So one of the things that we like to tell kids uh, and even parents, we unfortunately were involved with the suicide of a fourth grader, uh, fifth grader that took their life. And we actually had a play therapist with us. Her name is Cindy Lee and just a premier therapist in the state of Utah. And when we got to the school, our crisis team has about 30 members on it, therapists, uh, mental health workers from the emergency room in the hospital. And I really looked to them early on to give us the ideas of how to handle this. And so when we went in and met with the principal, I just turned to Cindy and said, Cindy, guide us through this process because we this is our first experience with an elementary suicide and so she asked for a room so we got a room right across from the principal's office and um uh, they had and we put together an announcement to be read to every in every classroom and then we said if you're struggling please come down and we had about probably there the school was about 700 k through six we had about 150 kids come down uh, throughout the day. And what Cindy did is she had paper set around these four tables that were set up. So we did not do individual counseling or individual groups at first. And when the kids came in, we passed out the papers and Cindy would get up and say, you know, she'd do a little talk, but she would say, you know, I, what we'd like you to do is spend some time drawing. And we want you to color a picture of your house with the sunset, a sunrise or a sunset. Um, and then when they were done, Cindy would collect those and, and all of us helped her. But it was fascinating for me because what she said was the more dark the colors, the more we need to be concerned. And at first I thought, hmm, well, I'm, I don't think we're gonna get that many. But we had about 15 kids, their sunsets was were all black. I mean, it was, it was amazing how Cindy had predicted exactly what happened. And out of those 15 kids, that's when they were then met with by the school counselors, our, our therapists and others individually. And we ended up actually hospitalizing uh, one of the fifth graders that was very close to this young lady that took her life. But Cindy would talk with the kids that were going back that had the perfect drawings, the sunsets, et cetera. She you know, shared with them, these are some of the things that you can do to get through the grief, the things that you're struggling with. Spend time with friends. You know, Now with COVID, it makes it difficult, but you can still do it through a phone call, through Zoom, chat or whatever. 
listen to music that relaxes you, watch TV or movies, go for a walk, play a sport, draw, play an instrument, uh, dance, pray, watch a funny movie. So those were the things that she talked about when you go home. And these were the things that we talked about um, with their parents. So um, she also talked uh, in, 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 in other situations, um, she said, you know, that weeks and months after the suicide, you may, you may have a response to it, including nightmares, flashbacks, difficulty concentrating, social withdrawal, loss of interest in usual activities. And Cindy talks about this is quite common for individuals that have had any kind of death experience. If they were there, they were involved in it. She shared the story about a family that uh, there was a serious car wreck and two of the, two of the four individuals in, in the car wreck died. And the other two went through these experiences as they were grieving it. Um, the important thing that, that we like to talk about is that staff and students should understand that while stress reactions are common, if they persist for three months or more, they're likely to become chronic. chronic. And that's where we get the PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. World War II, we didn't know what it was. And now we actually see it's quite common. And it's not just in the military. It's people that have had those individual experiences. And, and when it starts to overcome or overwhelm you, you know, that's when you really need to, you know, maybe talk to a therapist or a professional. The other part of it is it's really important to remember staff. A lot of times we zero in and focus on kids, but it's just as important as I mentioned earlier that we need to make sure we focus on staff and we focus on the community to help deal with that PTSD. So what are the things, what are the healthy coping strategies that we can use with grief? Um, that really help. Number one, reach out to loved ones, friends, spiritual leaders for comfort, understand, and healing. And, you know, the, the experts around me really talk about surrounding yourself with people who are willing to listen. We, we call it that connection. Uh, you know, when I do, when I work with a family that's really struggling with a child, I always ask, who are your, who are your child's best friends? And the ones that do not have very many are the ones that tend to, to struggle. Um, I love this concept. Uh, you know, the healthy coping strategy is to grieve in your own way. Too many times we as adults want people just to get over it. And it's like, come on, it's been, it's been a month. It's been a week. Just get over it. You know, death is part of life. But everybody grieves differently. Um, it's one of the things that we use with our crisis team when we come on board. I learned it early on. We had, after a, a, a suicide, we had um, some football players that went out by the football field and they were just sobbing, but they didn't want anybody else in the school to see him cry. You know, the big macho kids. We have other kids that just hold it in, you know, even after a family's death or anything that way. Um, if you find it too painful to visit your loved one's gravesite or share the details of your loved one's death, you know, wait until you're ready. I love that. We, we think we adults have this timeline of the way we want people to get get done and move on. Uh, and the reality, um, it really isn't that way. My wife uses the concept when she does therapy with these vets. She has one she's working with right now that lost two of his comrades over uh, in war and, and he blamed himself. And she kind of, she gives them this little rock and she talks about the concept that it's this huge boulder that you're carrying. And you don't eat, you don't drink, you don't sleep, you don't want to talk to anybody, and it just overwhelms your life. And she starts helping them understand that, you know, together we're going to chip away at that rock, you and I. And we're going to get to the point where you're going to carry that rock around with you, and you're going to put it in your pocket. And when you smell something that reminds you of this friend or these friends, you're going to remember the positive things. When you taste something, when you experience it, so that you learn to live with it in a very pause, positive, very healthy way to move forward in life. You know, one of the things that she talks a lot about is to be prepared for painful reminders. Um, you know, anniversaries, holidays, um, you know, what, whatever it is that, that may remind you, they call them triggers that, you know, don't chide yourself for being sad or mournful. mournful. Instead, consider changing 
um, you know, maybe some of those family traditions if it's, if it's too painful. Um, don't rush yourself. Losing someone to suicide is a tremendous blow and healing must occur at its own pace. We've talked about that. Don't be hurried by anyone else's expectation that it's been long enough and you need to move on. Um, except, expect setbacks. Some days will be better than others. Uh, you know, even years after the incident. Um, healing doesn't often happen in a straight line, and I love that, right? We're going to bounce around, we're going to bounce back, and it's going to be different for each of us depending on how we usually handle situations like that. So know when to seek professional help. You know, if you experience intense or unrelenting anguish or physical problems, you know, it's important. And, and we tell kids, you know, talk to your school counselor. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have a mental health social worker on campus or someone like that, don't be afraid to talk to them. And us advisors and school counselors, we need to encourage them. You know, if, if, it, if they can't get through it, they really need to see someone professional to help them. Um, one of the things that we've learned through the years, and it really is that you start to forget your pain and your agony when you start to do something for someone else. You know, so one of the things we like to ask is what are some things that you could do for a friend who is struggling? Um, when we start to focus on others, it actually may help as long as they continue to in, and identify and realize their pain, struggle, et cetera, that way. I, as a high school principal, I used to take my senior class every April um, down to Monument Valley and we would actually uh, spend a week on the Navajo reservation um, doing projects and other things. And, I can remember some of my students who really struggled with some abuse, emotional pain and other things, how I would finally start to see them smile as they were painting these homes and digging trenches and you know up on the roof uh, fixing shingles or whatever, because they felt like they were giving back and they were making a difference. And it's a very, very valuable tool uh, to be able to serve others. Other things, um, you know, that, that come up a lot, a lot of times kids will, you know, really angry why they died by suicide. And one of the things we talk about is the focus needs to be on, take it away from the suicide and trying to help them with their thoughts and feelings and everyone working together to prevent, you know, those future suicides. Um, I'm gonna skip that one. So, one of the things we talk young people is while these feelings are normal in the first few days and weeks after any kind of death, it's important for students to talk to a trusted adult if, if the feelings do not improve. And a lot of times kids won't talk to their parents. They, you know, they just feel like they don't understand or whatever. And talking to friends can really be the first step. And then hopefully that next step is, is talking, you know, to you school counselors, you school advisors and, and parents and others that way. So, you know, we, we tell students, it's important to reach out to a trusted adult. If, if, you, if you or if you have a friend who is experiencing some of the thoughts and feelings um, because there is help available. And we don't, you know, after, I tell parents after about two to three weeks, if you're not seeing any kind of improvement with, with the young people, you know, with, with your kids or grandkids or anything that way, um, then it's really important um, that, you know, we get help for them that way. Um, one of the things I like to remind young people is who are the trusted adults in your life? Who are the ones that you could go to if you were struggling uh, and if you had a very difficult time, sometimes you have to just sit down and talk with them and, um, you know, find out, you know, who are the ones I, I can turn to for help. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes and talk about hope squads and members and advisors after suicide, because it's what I do. I mean, it's what we're in almost a thousand schools right now around, around the, the world. And um, it's, it's one of the things that, you know, at some point, it, it, schools do deal with suicides and communities. Um, so what we've learned um, too many times is that we, we were working with a school and a beautiful young lady on the soccer team took her life. 
And when the crisis team came in, the crisis team focused with the soccer team. I mean, the counselors were out meeting with the soccer team and doing everything that way. And no one met with the Hope Squad. And about three or four days later, it was their uh, normal schedule for the crisis team to come together. I mean, for the Hope Squad to come together. And um, the advisor said, you know, let's just skip it because there's too many other things going on. And the Hope Squad kids said, no, we really need this. And come to find out two of the students that were on the Hope Squad had actually been working with that young lady that was on the soccer team. And they shared the difficulty they had because they said, you know, it was interesting everybody was responding and providing help to the soccer team and one of the Hope Squad kids actually was on the, the soccer team too but they said no one came in and, and worked with us as a Hope Squad and met with us students and so we actually put together this little guideline you know that after a suicide advisors notify the entire Hope Squad and then they invite the crisis team to come in and debrief with the Hope Squad. If there's any students involved, you know, with that student that took their life, uh, then they meet with them individually. Make sure you contact all the parents and then follow up uh, with, with the Hope Squad parents uh, and their families. Um, you know, the challenge, and it, it doesn't matter even if you're an adult, but um, there's nothing more difficult than a student suicide. I, I, I have seen um, adults um, devastated, um, just fall down, sobbing on the ground, on their desk, unable to even function uh, when they've lost one of their cherry students or a student member that they knew really well. Um, and just like us adults, Hope, Hope Squad students may be affected differently. What we see is in some situations, some may feel guilty that they did not prevent the suicide. Others may feel sad and they didn't recognize it. We're working with the school and I was talking with some of the students and this wasn't Hope Squad. This was just the regular ed students. And the one student, I'll never forget, he said, I sat right next to him and I didn't even know he was hurting. And then I had another one say, he and I ride the bus together. I mean, I talked with him this morning and I had no idea that he was hurting that bad. And so, you know, all of these emotions are valid and need to be understood and addressed as part of the grieving process. Um, and I, I kind of talked about this earlier that, you know, the research shows that closer the students are to the deceased, the more affected they are. Um, and then the second part, it's important to remember that everyone grieves differently. Uh, and then important for everyone to realize that not all suicides can be prevented. Although we tend to blame ourselves, what if I could have, you know, anything that way. Last night on the parent training that we did, one of these amazing mothers uh, went into the chat room and um, she actually shared with everybody on the chat that, um, um, she didn't recognize any of the signs that her daughter was hurting until after she died. And she said, now that I've gone through training, I see some of the things that I should have been aware of. Boy, that, that had to be difficult for her. Um, you know, we, after a suicide, it's good for the advisor to debrief, uh, meet with uh, the crisis team. If anyone needs help, you know, be seen by a professional. Um, and then, like I mentioned, you know, parents of all Hope Squad members are contacted and then important for advisors to, you know, to continue to monitor those young people because that grieving can, can really be overwhelming. I'm going to skip that. Um, what, one of the, the positive things that we have found, and I just have a couple more slides and then I'm hoping we can just talk openly about what you're seeing, what questions you have about the grieving process and maybe even ideas and examples and I can go into more detail of ours. Um, we have found some really positive ways to use the Hope Squad members that aren't struggling. Um, when we respond to a Hope Squad school and we have a crisis team, uh, we ask the Hope Squad members to escort the students to the crisis room where the counselors, therapists are or to the counseling center. 
it's amazing what that does to, for them to be able to connect with another student. We have Hope Squad members that travel the hallways. They check in the bathrooms. That's where a lot of girls will go in and they'll go into the stall and just have a really difficult time. And so we have those Hope Squad members check in the bathrooms. They travel the perimeter to see if any students need help. Uh, if there's a parent meeting that night, this is pre and post COVID. Uh, but we have the Hope Squad members welcoming the parents in. And then probably one of the most important things is to monitor that social media uh, with their peers and then immediately report any concerns uh, that they may have. Important to thank the Hope Squads, do not say anything negative that would blame the Hope Squad. Refer any concerns, you know, to, to you as the advisor and then, you know, continue to monitor the Hope Squad members. Um, one of the things I learned uh, as a, early on in my experience responding to a school, uh, we had a, a couple of school counselors that this kid was so, I think he was actually a student body president, and the counselors were so concerned that it was going to affect everybody. And this was a school of about 2,500 kids. And I was amazed that when everything was said and done, there were about 200 kids that we really needed to offer help for. Um, but everybody else didn't know the kid and they just wanted to go back to class because normacy provides so much support for many kids. And when you take that away and try to change it because you're dealing with the crisis, um, a lot of times you may actually do more harm. And one of the things I always talk about is do no harm. Do no harm. You know, when you come in with a crisis team, be very cautious that you're not creating more problems um, and, and, and trying to save and help everybody because not everybody needs saving and not everybody is, is in need of, of that support. We talked about connecting with the family that's lost. Um, I'm gonna skip these and I'm gonna end with this. Um, uh, I, I talk a lot about this, but um, this is parentguidance.org. This is uh, one of our programs now that we're providing to schools and uh, to our community partners. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. It's an amazing program. I would encourage you to go online and, and look at it and then please make it available to your parents. It, it's provided to us by the Cook Foundation, um, parentguidance.org. And what it is, it's, it's, uh, they have actually uh, contracted with some of the most amazing therapists across the country. They have lessons, they have information, uh, they have everything that you can go on. You can get your questions answered. You can take a class for free that will teach you about anxiety, your child's depression, challenges with your family or anything that, that parents may have. Uh, and um, it, it is really a great program. Look at it, um, use it, and let us know because we want to hook you up so that you can have um, direct support from these guys because they're just amazing. Okay, so questions, I'm going to end my screen there. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and I just want to see what questions um, everybody may have. I any questions? And we can unmute you or we can just take the questions off of the slides. No questions? Oh, let's see. Okay, so here's a really good question. When schools want to do a mem uh, memorial, what, what should they consider? You know, it's interesting, in, in my district, we've really pushed not to have any memorial because invariably what happens is um, you will lose someone um, in a car wreck, cancer or whatever. So you give the empty chair at graduation or you plant a tree, you do all these different things. And then there's a suicide that comes along and you say, ooh, we're not going to do that because we don't want to promote, you know, the incident. And so in my district, we have, we have, just, we have just taken a stand um, um, that we don't do memorials. Now, I work with districts that do, and one of the things that I strongly encourage them to do is to be 
distant. If you're going to do this for a child that died by suicide, you have to do it for a child that, um, that you know, or if you do this for a child that's died by cancer, you got to do this for an individual who's died by suicide. And they've had pretty good success with it. Um, I think you, ha you just have to be careful with it um, and, and make sure you're consistent. I don't think there's any perfect right or wrong. We have found in our district that we don't do any memorials for graduation. We'll hand deliver the diploma to the family, you know, other things that way. Um, let's see, um, I'm just looking at the questions. Um, uh, I struggle with knowing how to respond to students questioning the meaning of life uh, after loss of a loved one. That's a tough one. I have to be honest, that is a very, very difficult. What I like to do is turn around and, and if, you know, Johnny was in my office, the first thing I would ask Johnny is, what, what was your experience before this situation? Um, um, and um, what are the triggers? So I would try to try to understand what were the feelings, what, what's causing those emotions and, and those feelings? Because I always like to start out by um, peeling back the layers to understand what got us to this point uh, and then try to build from there. Connection by far is the most important piece that you can provide to any kid um, you know, that may be struggling. I love this question. Have you thought about creating a grief book for students to process their own grief about their friend? No, we haven't, but we're going to put it on our list. And I think that's a great idea that can be sponsored by the local Hope Squad. So we're going to ask Jennifer um, to kind of put some things together. Um, so um, one of the questions, um, let's see, I'm seeing more. Let's see, Every, uh, let's see. Are you, available, are you available for advice in the case that something arises? Yeah, always. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll give you, uh, Kathy, put my phone number and my email on the chat room. And so if you need it, I, I, I get called all the time. I get called by law enforcement, I get call, called by faith base, and I get called by school administrators, counselors 24 uh, seven throughout the year. Um, so this one is, how would you, how should you handle situations where a number of years ago, a coworker lost a parent to suicide? Is it expected to never say suicide or talk about it? Uh, actually, no. One of the best things you could do is to sit down with that individual one-on-one -on -one in a private moment and talk about it and ask the question, you know, Sally, how are you doing? I know you lost your mom to suicide and that had to be very difficult. I, uh, I, one of the most difficult experiences for me is I um, went to a home after a suicide and invariably what happens is all of the neighborhood church friends come over and support the mom, but very few dads come over because we're so uncomfortable. We don't know how to help each other. We don't know how to support. That's not the tools that were given to us males, unfortunately. And here was this dad sitting out on the porch. Actually, he was in the living room when I got there. And the mom was in the kitchen. And, and I honestly believe there were probably 30 or 40 mothers in there. And so I could tell she was being helped. And so I walked through the out through the living room and there was the dad sitting in the chair. And I leaned over and I said, are you okay? And, and he was just stern. He just wasn't crying. He was just looking forward. And he said, no, I'm not. And I said, you want to talk? And so we went out on the steps and um, he just started to cry and to sob. And I get emotional thinking about it. And I reached over and put my hand on his and we sat there and held hands and I'd never met this guy before. And he said, and he mentioned his son's name that had taken his life. And he said, this, he was my best friend. He and I went hunting together. He and I went, you know, did all of these things together. And he, and he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. It, it was, it was really powerful. Um, talking about it can be the best thing that we can do. So don't, you have a friend, you have a family member, don't be afraid uh, to, to not mention it. And I like to use the I message. You know, I want you to know we're going to be talking about suicide at the 
school. I wanted to check in with you because I know your mother, you know, took her life and I want to know how you're doing. Are you okay? Is there anything that I can do to help? Um, um, and, it, it, you know, you may know, you know, a better approach, whatever, but don't be afraid to ask about it. Um, so Jackie says our school did a beautiful memorial page in the yearbook, along with the suicide hotline, hotline number for my son. I love that. And I hope they do that for every other person, you know, that dies at the school. What if the family requests the school to participate in a community event that honors the child? How can the school most appropriately participate without causing harm or seeming to be unfeeling by not participating? Great question. So so one of the things that I like to do is when I meet with those families and they ask that, I'll tell them, you know, why don't we get uh, a community night and we'll have a presentation on mental health and we'll bring in the local experts to talk talk about what parents can do, what kids can do, what we, can get, what we can do as a community to do everything that we can to prevent the next one. And then I try to educate the parent. You know, Mrs. So-and-so, I just want you to know that the research shows that the more that we focus on the event, the more risk or challenge that we may have an another student who may be thinking about it. And, and I, I've been in the middle of, of contagions and copycats and um, it's, it's a difficult situation. So I would try to build off the positive and say, let's do something. But in, in response to, a, to for your son, let's bring in and make it a mental health night and let's do it every, I mean, you know, so there's some things that you could really use um, uh, to build off of that. Um, this one says, I worry that my struggles with mental health will be too big of a burden for my children. What should I be doing? Um, get help. Um, I worked with a family that the father had uh, was schizophrenic and um, he would have the ups and downs because he wasn't staying on his medication and they brought me in to kind of help with the, the clergy. And one of the things that I talked about when the father was healthy is the impact that he was having on the rest of the children. And we actually did a family group therapy where we sat down with all of the family and allowed the family to share their emotional feelings. And I was amazed at how emotional it was. And it was fascinating for the dad to hear these messages, 13 year old daughter, 15 year old son. I think there was an eight or nine year old, I can't remember if it was a boy or girl, but, um, they one by one shared their emotions and their feelings and their experiences. And, and then we talked about as a family, how do we deal with mental health as a family? And it was very, very powerful. And I think the more that we can do it as a family, so it's not us alone, but it's us as a family trying to deal with this mental health issue, uh, the, more, the more healthy we can be uh, to resolving it. Any other questions? Wow, these have been great questions. I think I'm going to write a book on all these questions. Um, as someone with personal experience with suicide, in general, how do you be there for someone without triggering your own emotions? Best way to prepare if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a great question. Can I tell you, uh, Kathy and I and our crisis team were at another elementary school after a suicide, and we'd been there two long days, and we met with hundreds of kids and parents. And it was the second day we were wrapping up. We were meeting with the principal in the conference room, and the secretary stuck her head in, and she said, hey, there's one more student that needs help. Could someone come out? And everybody was so tired, so I just jumped up and said, yeah, I'll do it. So I met with this amazing little Latino boy. I think he was about third grade, dark hair, beautiful black eyes. And when we went into the nurse's office, which is nurse station, which had the, the bed, you know, I mean, it was very teeny. And he, he sat up on the bed and I sat in the chair and, and we talked. And finally, as I was starting to peel back what was going on, uh, he shared with me that his grandfather had died about six weeks before. And so we talked about it, talked about the things that he could do to cope, things that he could do, you know, uh, to, deal, to deal with the grief and other things. So when we got done, he, he jumps down and gets to the door and he opens the door and he turns back to me and he goes, and he, he didn't pronounce my name very well, but he said, Dr. Hudno, are you okay? 
And I just started to cry. I mean, here was this amazing young person who was caring about me uh, after two very difficult days of working with a lot of people with suicide uh, who, who were dealing with those emotions. Um, I think what you have to do is I would first of all suggest that you see a therapist so that it sounds like you, you have because you know your triggers. Um, as you identify those triggers, it's important that as you support family, that you build um, a, a safe line. So you're not gonna cross this line. So as you're helping family members and you can see your trigger, I would encourage you that you either A, have another family member or your spouse and that you've pre-planned so that when this incident comes up. Uh, I used it as an example with parents last night that um, the, when, when we were raising our kids, we had four kids, raised them on a farm in Provo. When sometimes when my kids were teenagers, they were mad at me and I was mad at them and I didn't want to talk to them. And so I'd turn to my wife and say, hey, honey, this is your turn. I think that's what you need to do with your spouse so that there's, there's this connection and support. And if it's not a spouse, then maybe another family member that, you know, when these things happen, it creates a trigger for me and I can't deal with it. I'm going to need you to intercede and come in and provide the help because I'm not going to be able to deal with it. So you want to surround yourself with those support systems. Here's another one. I've lost two sons to suicides and I'm an elementary junior high Hope Squad advisor. Wow, bless you for what you're doing. I don't usually share much personal info about my life to the kiddos, but I'm wondering what the most appropriate response is when they are aware and bring it up. I'm not afraid to talk about it, but want to be sensitive to their little feelings. Is it best to keep that super private or is it okay for appropriate discussion? It's very much appropriate, very appropriate for that discussion, but here's the boundaries that I would give or share or challenge you to consider. The more we talk about our incidences, and it's not a learning or teaching moment, the more it takes away from what really should happen. So if, if, if I'm teaching a lesson, I may say, and let me share with what happened to me and my feelings and emotions, but it's all built around this lesson and this message I'm giving. Because what I see in too many situations is that people that have lost someone, it becomes their platform and it, and it continues and it continues and it continues. And I've seen it personally, I've experienced it personally, and I've heard it from Hope Squad kids and other advisors that we can't get past what Mr. Mr. or Mrs. is talking about. Every time we bring it up, they bring up their personal experience. So good on you for not talking about it yet, but I'm giving you permission to do it. And when those teaching moments are possible, jump on it. Because that, the more personal we can be with young people, the more they're going to buy into it and believe it and accept it. Um, next one is, um, from participation, I worry that my struggles with mental health will be too big of a burden for my children. What should I be doing? Um, if it's too much of a burden, talk to a professional. Find out from professional um, CBT training uh, therapy cognitive behavior therapy is one of the best uh, models out there right now the VA is using it with the uh, return vets and others uh, it's a very good program that cognitively helps you become aware of those triggers and those challenges uh, and will help you replace those triggers with other things I, I don't I think it's okay to share with the children um, what the mental health struggles are what you have to be careful with is that it doesn't overwhelm them. You don't want to make them responsible for your feelings or emotions, and you don't want them to be responsible to be your, your health care provider. What you want them to be is, is a non-threatening, unconditional, loving family member that's going to support you through those struggles. Very, very important. And that's why I love family therapy, because it gives you a chance to bring those family members together, to build those guidelines, even the lines in the sand that say, when I get to this point, we, you know, I need to see a professional. But in the meantime, I want family members to support, even talk about it, other things that way. Because if you don't, 
then they don't understand, they don't comprehend uh, because their mind's not fully developed and they may not see or understand what's really going on. So the more we can be honest, uh, then the, the, the more I think it will help uh, the, the family heal and, and support each other. It, those are great questions. Any other questions? You know, thank you. Thank you for what you do. You, you are amazing folks. And I cannot um, say enough because I think you're wonderful. Um, and if there's anything that we can ever do, don't be afraid to email us or contact us. We're here to serve. Um, so um, let's see. All right, Abby, back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Greg. And thank you everyone for joining today. I think it was a great discussion that we had and, you know, it opened up a lot of questions, which was great to hear. Um, if you, yes, Greg. <laughs> All right. This one question keeps coming up and I think it's a great question. Um, how do we respond? How do we support students during COVID? And I think that's a great question. Um, I've worked with some uh, phenomenal teachers that and counselors that are doing different things. Um, one counselor shared with me every morning, she sends out a positive quote to her Hope Squad members. And, and she does it by name. So, hey, Sally, just want you to know, you know, something very positive. Um, so it's that contact, more and more contact, you know, just like Zoom and uh, other messages and different things that way, the more positive that we can support kids. Sorry, Abby, thank you. No, that's perfect. I think, you know, one of, the biggest problems today is that we're all going through a little bit of grief and we're all suffering just a little bit with COVID. And I think it's great that we answered that question. Um, thank you all so much for joining today. If you have questions about the webinar, you can email me at Abigail A for hope. That's a number four um, at gmail.com. Um, and I will, everybody who's emailed me so far about getting a um, webinar copy, I will send that to you as soon as the recording is up. So thank you all for joining and have a great rest of your week. Take care everybody, be safe.